live NFL trivia every Wednesday night on Twitch at 9 p.m. Eastern. Come show off your football knowledge for a chance to win cash prizes. Check the link in the description to find out more. And now, on with our feature presentation. There are some bowl games that are etched in the history of college football, and that have made it for years and years. Yes, you have your bowl games that have been around for what seems like forever, like the Rose Bowl and the Cotton Bowl. But even with newer bowl games that were created when the influx of new bowls started popping up in the 1990s and 2000s, there are some that have done a great job establishing themselves as part of the zeitgeist of college football. The Las Vegas Bowl, the New Mexico Bowl, the New Orleans Bowl, and the Potato Bowl, just to name a few, are games that are ingrained in bowl season, even though they are less than 30 years old, and in some cases, less than 20 years old. And between attractive matchups, good organization, a solid stadium and location, and a bunch of other things, it's not hard to see why these bowl games have made it. On the other hand, there are some bowl games where they don't last long, and it is very easy to see why. Case in point, the Houston Bowl, otherwise known as the EV1.net Bowl, otherwise known as the GalleryFurniture.com Bowl, because of course there was a dot-com bowl at the height of the dot-com bubble. This game lasted half a decade, flaming out in a blaze of glory. And considering how the very first edition of this game went, yeah, it's not hard to see why that was the case. Because the Houston Bowl, from the onset, showed that they were willing to lie about anything and everything to make their bowl game look good. And the end result was a massive controversy that destroyed the bowl's reputation and standing within the community before the very first game even kicked off. This is the story behind the bizarre controversy at the 2000GalleryFurniture.com Bowl. Before we talk about the controversy in question, we need some context to understand what this bowl game was supposed to be, as well as the two teams playing in it, and why this game was even held in the first place. For nearly three decades, from 1959 to 87, there was a bowl game played in Houston known as the Blue Bonnet Bowl, which is what you're watching highlights of right now, and it was somewhat of a prestigious game. There were routinely battles between top 20 teams, and in 1975, in front of over 52,000 people, you even had a top 10 matchup between a number 9 ranked Texas team and a number 10 ranked Colorado team. That made it one of just four bowl games that season, alongside the Sugar Bowl, the Orange Bowl, and the Fiesta Bowl, to feature two teams ranked inside the top 10. In short, the Blue Bonnet Bowl was a big deal at one point, but by 1987, the game had fallen on hard times. Ticket sales were poor. The final edition between Texas and Pittsburgh only drew 23,282 fans into the large venue known as the Astrodome, which was not just the lowest attendance ever for the game, and was not just the first time that the game drew less than 30,000 people, but was a far cry from the 67,000 people that the game was drawing at its peak. And the game was unable to secure a title sponsor, or a good television contract, both of which were becoming incredibly necessary to have the funding to properly put on a bowl game. Because of this, Along with a few other factors, the Blue Bonnet Bowl was discontinued after the 1987 season, meaning that the city of Houston, after nearly three decades, would now be without a bowl game. Enter two men that were looking to change that over a decade later. You had businessman Jim McInvale, best known in the Houston area as Mattress Mac, selling mattresses. And you had promoter Jerry Ippoliti, who already had success creating the Motor City Bowl. They both believed that Houston was a perfect location for a bowl game, and that after going more than a decade without one following the collapse of the Blue Bonnet Bowl, it was time for the city to get one again. McIndale said, We hope to establish one of the marquee postseason college football games in the nation. Houston's a great football town, and there's no reason if we get behind this game and market, it won't be one of the top bowl games in the country. That's what we're looking for. He also said that the game could rival the Rose Bowl and the Cotton Bowl, which, oh boy, that's quite the statement. I don't think any dot-com bowl game is going to rival the Rose Bowl, but let's not get ahead of ourselves here. McInvale was incredibly confident in this game, as was Ippoliti, who was questioned about why this game would work when Houston wasn't a great sports town, with teams that drew consistently poor attendance across all venues. His response was, We're different. You just watch. These two men were coming out swinging for the fences. So what would the first bowl matchup be? Well, this would be a matchup between two pretty solid teams, albeit two teams ranked outside the top 25 in the AP poll. In one corner, you had the Pirates of East Carolina, 
led by eventual Jacksonville Jaguars quarterback David Garrard, the only quarterback in the conference to throw a touchdown pass in every game that season. They finished the season second in Conference USA, only behind Louisville, and they did it with one of the more well-rounded mid-major teams in the country, as they finished inside the top 40 in points scored and points allowed. This was an East Carolina team that hadn't won a bowl game since 1995, when they beat Stanford in the Liberty Bowl. So if they won this game and broke a drought of half a decade, then this would mean a lot, and would be a big deal to the school and the community, and would be quite the way to cap off head coach Steve Logan's ninth season in charge of the program. And in the other corner, you had the Red Raiders of Texas Tech. I would say they were the local team in this game, but I can't really say that, because Lubbock is more than 500 miles away from Houston. However, Texas Tech, led by Mike Leach and his air raid offense in his very first season as head coach of the program, went 7-1 against unranked competition, and had a defense that, while inconsistent, could be spectacular at times, as they shut out three opponents, including two opponents in Big 12 play in Oklahoma State and Baylor, and they held their opponent to 7 points or less in 5 of their 12 games. On paper, this was shaping up to be a great game, as it seemed like for the very first edition of the GalleryFurniture.com Bowl, everything was going to be good. This was the only bowl game taking place on the night of December 27th, so there was no competition whatsoever, and it had the national television exposure on ESPN2. Everything was in place. Now, it was time to sell some tickets. And this is where things go completely haywire. Because Jerry Ippolini was about to do something so stupid that overnight, the Bulls' credibility was destroyed and would never be taken seriously again. On December 7, 2000, three weeks before the bowl game was supposed to be played, Jerry Ippolini announced some absolutely fantastic news. The bowl game had already sold 28,000 tickets. Three weeks out, that figure is absolutely fantastic. A lot of times with bowl games, you see articles where the bowl is struggling with ticket sales a week away. But then, everything turns out alright, because there's usually a late local push to get tickets sold, and there's usually a strong walk-up crowd. So to have 28,000 tickets sold three weeks before the game, which was more than what was sold for the entirety of the 1987 Blue Bonnet Bowl, the last bowl game played in Houston? Well, that is nothing short of superb. When you think of the walk-up crowd that's going to eventually play a part in these ticket sales, as well as people from the schools who were on the fence about going, or hadn't bought tickets yet because the game was just announced and they're trying to finalize plans, it means you're going to be on pace to have a sold-out crowd, or a near-sold-out crowd, at the Astrodome. You want to talk about instant credibility and prestige for this game? A packed Astrodome is a great way of doing that, and the Astrodome was well on its way to doing just that. However, something about this number felt a bit fishy. It was a really good number, but it was almost too good to be true. This was a Houston market that routinely drew poor attendance to sporting events. The Houston Rockets were in the midst of a season where you couldn't give tickets away to their games, as during the 2000-2001 season, they drew just 12,648 fans to the game on average, which was 4,000 fans below the league-wide average and was quite easily the lowest total in the NBA. Rice couldn't bring fans to their games. Three of their five home games during the 2000 season drew under 11,500 people, with one game against Fresno State coming dangerously close to an abysmal four-figure attendance total. Houston could bring fans to their games. Three of their four games drew under 18,000 fans, and their season finale against Louisville drew just 3,006 fans. 3,000 fans at a Division 1A game is embarrassing. Something seemed odd. No other team in Houston besides the Astros, who just opened up a brand new ballpark, were drawing well on the sporting side. This game was a brand new bowl game with no local team, no top 25 team, and was being played during the holiday season in a venue that was nearly 40 years old and was rotting. Attendance at anything football related in Houston over the past decade was really poor. And this game already sold 28,000 tickets three weeks out? That seems too good to be true. So some people did some digging. And what they found was a figure and a stat that would sink the credibility of this bowl game forever, giving it a major black eye for its reputation. Because the bowl game did not sell 28,000 tickets. That number was just a teeny tiny bit inflated. That raises the question, 
how many tickets did the bowl game actually sell? If this was a number like 27,000 or 26,000, then this would be a complete non-story, and everyone, including myself, would be making a mountain out of a molehill. Alas, it was not. Alright, maybe it was in the 20,000 range. Nope. The high 10,000s range? Try again. The low 10,000s range? Not even close. We were talking four figures. And in the most important recount to ever take place in the year 2000, the figures show that the GalleryFurniture.com Bowl grossly over-exaggerated the amount of tickets sold by December 7th. The exact number? 4,200. That's right. 4,200 tickets were sold. Just a tiny bit off from 28,000. The GalleryFurniture.com Bowl said that the number of tickets they sold for this game was a whopping seven times higher than what it actually was. I'm sorry, what? Why would you lie about this? Not only are you destroying your credibility and your reputation, but people are going to have some serious questions, and rightfully so, when they see shots of a stadium that looks empty when you admitted that you sold so many tickets. And it's not like you can blame the weather if there are a bunch of no-shows. You're playing in a freaking dome. You cornered yourself pretty badly here. So yeah, the GalleryFurniture.com Bowl had a lot of explaining to do. And Jim McInvale, whose company was sponsoring the game, was now on incredibly rocky terms with Wolf President Jerry Ippoliti. Which is always a good sign when we haven't even kicked off the game yet, and the Bowl sponsor is feuding with the Bowl President. Great way to build relationships, and it's not hard to see why Gallery Furniture stopped sponsoring this game shortly after, seeing as their Bowl President was willing to lie to them. I believe he, the man who announced this figure and lied to everyone, never even faced the music. Instead, it was McInvale who spoke on the figure, and lashed out at everyone. As McInvale said, I'm sorry that Jerry made the mistake in the tick account. I was a little bit upset about it. I asked Jerry where he came up with that rather outlandish figure. He said he's gotten it from the ticket people, that he got him some bad information. So I believe he was throwing the ticket people under the bus. I can promise you, no ticket person miscounts the number 4200 for the number 28000. No ticket person is dumb enough, incompetent enough, or stupid enough to count every single ticket at the game seven times over. I believe he started a gigantic lie, got caught on it, and then decided to backtrack by saying it was the fault of the ticket people. Even though I know for a fact that the ticket people would not come up with such a crazy figure. Just because the difference between 4200 and 28000 is so astronomical that it is almost comical. When the game ended, it was East Carolina who came out on top by a final score of 40 or 27, in a high scoring game that was not as close as the final score might indicate, as ECU led 34 0 at one point in the first half. But the real story was the behind the scenes drama with the GalleryFurniture.com Bowl, as the title sponsor was absolutely fuming at the Bowl president for blatantly lying and misrepresenting the number of tickets sold. And again, when you consider all this drama, unfounded cockiness, and distrust, all before the first game was even played, it's not hard to see why this bowl game did not make it. At least Houston has the Texas Bowl today, which seems like a well-run bowl game, or at the very least, better run than whatever the heck this was, which is not exactly a high bar to clear. So what's the moral of the story? I don't even want to say it's not to lie because it will always come back to bite you. The moral is that if you're going to lie, don't make up some outlandish figure that raises eyebrows and makes no sense whatsoever. If you're organizing a bowl game, just think of what Jerry Ippolini did on this day, and then do literally the exact opposite. Because just like the dot-com bubble, his tickets sold statement burst in absolutely spectacular fashion. Get your official Jaguar Gator 9 merchandise by going to jg9shop.com. And be sure to like this video, ring the notification bell, and subscribe down below if you haven't already, as it helps the channel out a lot. And be sure to check out Twitch every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern for your chance to play NFL trivia and win cash prizes. Link in the description below. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping out the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. So you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.